the idea that you had to get shot at or do something, uh, quote unquote, heroic to be considered that is untrue. You're going over and doing these and doing this deployment is no small task at all. It is a really, really tough transition to come back from. Hats off to you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you did. It was very, very important. And it, it is heroic. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel, have a half century of aviation experience in combat helicopters, airliners, and air traffic control. They answer your questions about flying, aviation, and ATC. This weekly podcast is for entertainment and education and does not serve as a replacement for a qualified flight instructor, an examiner, the FARs, the 7110, your best friend, your next pilot, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200 frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike Clear Visual Approach Runway 23 Left Connect Tower. November 3222 Yankee Area of Heavy to Extreme Precipitation 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock. 15 miles, 7 miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie Try Departure Radar Contact Climb and Maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima Reduce Speed to 180. You're overtaking traffic ahead on fun. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk CFR, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Manor, Sierra Papa, clear to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special VFR conditions. Please welcome retired Army pilot Alpha Golf and the rookie first officer at Penguin Airlines, Romeo Hotel. It's Tuesday, September 10th, 2024, episode 349. On today's show, we'll discuss the importance of altimeter settings, Neod Sweeven, and more of your awesome feedback. What's up, AG? Hello. Hello, everyone. Hey, Neod Sweeven. Some people don't know what that is. S- explain it real quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it stands for Northeast northeast odd southwest even so for those of you that don't know depending on what direction you're flying in your plane you need to be at either even or odd altitude so if you are going to the right of the north south line basically you should be uh odd at an odd altitude, mm-hmm. five, seven, nine, eleven, some you know something, something like that, and the other way is even. So that's just a little thing to help you remember it. Neod Sweven, northeast odd, southwest even. I like it. I've never seen it spelled the way. Well, I've never seen it written out. I've just heard people say it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I <laughs> so you wrote, know out, to... wrote out knee as K N E E, like your leg knee. <laughs> Except when you're in Florida, they do a different. They do an east-west delineator for traffic, and it's odd to the north, I believe, and even to the south. Ah, uh, makes sense because most traffic is going in those directions. Mm-hmm. Uh, to avoid everybody being at the same altitude, right? <laughs> or, or the same even or odd. So, how's your week been? Uh good. Uh, well, how, let's just say how was last week from the time we hit stop. Until yep. now, that's the part I'm talking about. Oh, uh, right. Um, last week was pretty uneventful. Mm-hmm. As far as I remember, nothing stands out. Mm-hmm. Uh, my overtime ended up getting canceled. Perfect. I don't think I'll be as lucky the next two weeks. I don't know. I have Saturdays. Hmm. Both weeks mm. on the desk. I think one's on the desk. What if there were supervisors that could do what that desk thing? if there were? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice if, if we had people to do their job? Uh, uh, I commuted on an Airbus for the first time. Oh, man. It was a big Airbus. The Airbus 300. Ooh. The oh. area for the jump seaters 
Well, it was just me. But there were room for six jump seaters, chairs for six. Not in the cockpit. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's uh, <laughs> and behind it. It's so yeah, there's back a, in the little galley. Yeah, so or, there's a, yeah. well, it's for some reason they can't utilize maybe ten feet from the cockpit back to where this uh, barrier is up. Everything behind that is cargo, but for some reason this part's unusable. Maybe it's I don't know if the airplane is starting to round in. I'm not sure, but um, it's huge. You could do a gymnastics routine back there. Nice. <laughs> Uh, that would be awesome. If you were inclined to do to that. See, see that. <laughs> they could use it for one of those zero-G flights, though. There's enough room where you could do that. Let's take this yeah. plane up and just do a parabola, JJ's favorite word, and <laughs> and go zero-G for a little bit. Yeah. Is that... Are there special modifications that must be made to a plane? Well, just a regular old Airbus 300 tolerate going zero g for an extended period of time um hmm i don't know don't they use a 727 for that that doesn't that seems like in the same category of yeah i didn't know if they hey, had just made miss. modifications to i don't know maybe that's a good question i don't know don't they just go into sort of like a, a dive into that what's the plane doing when it when everybody's floating around yeah, it's so it's for a from while. basically where they offload it at the top of the uh, arc f- all the way down to the bottom of okay. the next one. Okay. Um, it's zero G. So, I mean, I don't... the Like I, I've said before, the Chinook, it did not like zero G at all. Just mm. Nothing w- worked right. <laughs> nothing. Not good. Very bad. You're starving the pumps. I would imagine that the, the fluid situation in the engines does have to have some sort of modification to that sustained and not have yeah, them. Yeah. Right. If anybody knows that and could maybe write it in less than 200 words, don't please don't send a bunch of stuff we have to read. Cause, yeah, know, like two pages is worth of, yeah. <laughs> How does this airplane survive this? Is there any sort of wing strut modifications or... And, yeah. and what is happening in the engine? Extra pumps? Uh, upside down pumps? I don't know. Upside down pumps. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> it could be. Before everybody realizes we really don't know what we're talking about, shall we begin? Probably should. <laughs> All right. Ooh, I'm going to play different music in the background on this one. I'm going to try this out. Really? Mm-hmm. It's the OB Rock song. It'll be in the background on this. You won't be able to hear it right now. I won't. But the audio but they version. they will. Yep, here we go. Mm. Since OB348, we have a lot of new patrons again in the show listeners here. Mike Papa, Alpha Sierra, Charlie Oscar, Charlie Mike, Mike Mike, Delta Oscar, Whiskey Echo, and Tango Whiskey. Welcome. In the show supporter tier, Mike Alpha, November Whiskey, Alpha Delta, Romeo Sierra, who came up from the show listener tier, and a new Supreme Galactic Aviation Commander, Juliet Charlie. We got PayPal drops from Bravo Hotel, Golf Mike Square. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, go to the website, patreon.com slash opposing bases. You can find out more there or head over to our website, opposingbases.com slash support. If you want to do a one-time drop via PayPal, if you're new to the show and you want to get our episodes each week, hit subscribe or follow, depending on what podcast player you're using. Our weekly episode will show up automatically. It's magic. And if you have time, leave us a review and only five-star ratings. Only five. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Review and announcements. Review and <laughs> announcements. Speaking of five stars, we're going to get to that later on. Mm. A scandal. It is a scandal. I know what you're talking about. It is a scandal. I wish we could do something about it. Like, we could control that. <laughs> yeah. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, and highly suspect. <laughs> well, it is now. It, it it is very sus, as they say. Yes, it's as the kids say. <laughs> That's the only word I will hear on the show. I don't want to hear their language because we're going to say something wrong. <laughs> sus makes sense. It does. Okay. Do you want the review? I don't know. No, I. Just, 
Actually, I don't really want to do anything this whole show. <laughs> I'll just scroll down. I'll just keep scrolling and tell you to keep reading stuff. Mm, okay. Fine. I'll do the <laughs> review. Jeez. You talked me into it. <laughs> I don't know if we've even read this before because I I couldn't find a new one. I just went back in time. I saw the date. I don't remember reading this. I don't either. But so I also don't remember it. what I did yesterday. So That's right. I can't. I just had breakfast. I have no idea what it was. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> makes, makes the, that sort of memory just really makes the flying public so comfortable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We remember the important stuff, all right? Just relax. Yeah, what, the altitude I sent you to. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Five star review. Incredible. Incredible podcast. This podcast is amazing. <clears throat> That's it. That's the review. Greatest review ever. <laughs> ever. As a re- very recent CPC, that's why I included this. It's from another controller. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. At a, fair, at a fairly busy level six Delta, this podcast... Oh, man. A level six tower only. Ah, You are getting your butt whooped. You are working so hard. You wonder why you made this choice. Yeah. How did I get here? (laughs) This podcast (laughs) has helped me keep pushing through. This is my fourth facility, third tower, first FAA facility. Wow. Does FAA training hit different? (laughs) AG and RH do such a good, uh, great job of speaking to both sides of the pilot controller relationship. This podcast has helped me transition from my slow East contract life to the FAA life. Thanks for all you guys do. Uh, from Confused Ninja. <laughs> I like cool. that review. Here, let me explain why I said that. If we, we haven't talked about levels in a while, I don't think. The formula figures out your pay band based on complexity. A tower only... I'll give you an example. Midway, Chicago, busy airline airport. That's a nine or an eight. At, from so. On the four to 12 scale, it's it's about in the middle. It's close to where Triad and Duke are. And it's crazy. They, they're, they work so many airplanes. <laughs> right. But that's my, I'm trying to put them in perspective here. Yeah, yeah. For you to get that high of a number for a tower at a place that doesn't have airlines, a Delta airport, Typically doesn't have a, a lot of airline traffic. Yeah, maybe a couple. <laughs> You're working but. GA pattern all day long. A lot of it. Yeah. Like you have a little clicker in your hand, counting operations, hourly putting it into some log somewhere. Yes. You're busy the whole day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so my point is you have to work for that. And you don't really get compensated for the amount of work you're putting in. Is that fair? That is totally fair. Okay. Uh, there was one other point I wanted to bring up in this, and I totally forgot. Oh, the video we got from a friend last night. Yes. One, I'm very surprised that the FA allowed that to be done. Even though it was in a simulator, it was pretty detailed. Yes. It, was a, it went through the whole thing. Yes, the whole thing. In the sim, at the academy, we go through emergency scenarios and really an exercise in phraseology. Can you say things correctly so that the computer understands? Can you keep up with arrivals and departures to three surfaces that all conflict in some way, shape, or form? Mm -hmm. Can you handle an emergency? I thought the video was really good. Yeah, they did a great job. For no training or maybe like a day of like, hey, let's move these little fake airplanes around in a room over here. Yeah. She did really good. Yeah, so when you read the comments... And you, these comments are obviously from controllers. the The video is not meant to be dis- presented to controllers, right? <laughs> People just totally lose the perspective of that. It's this is meant to be presented to the non aviation public, mm. and and maybe you know pi- some pilots. Like, hey, what is it like? What do controllers have to do? What's their training like? That's all this is. This, you know, they're like critiquing 
you know, the process. And <laughs> right. <laughs> come on. Right. Uh, come on. They do that in, they show the everything she says. They put it in re- red or green at the bottom of the screen if it was right or wrong. Uh, the animations were really good on Dude, showing. Dude, the editing and animation. Was they amazing. turned that tabletop into like a 3D, you know, yeah. and they're like moving planes around and everything. I'm like, whoa, somebody really. Spent some time on that. Yes. Yes. I thought it was really good. We should put a link to that in the show notes because it. Okay. I haven't seen the whole thing. I watched a few minutes of it and I was, just didn't have time to watch it yesterday. But I, if let, let me ask you this. Do you think people who are thinking about this job watching that would make them feel like hey, this looks like a lot of fun, or this looks terrifying, I don't want to do this. I think it could go either way. I think it depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Announcements. Patron Mike Foxtrot from under the hipster Charlie passed their initial CFI check ride. Congrats. Yes, very good. Patron Kilo Romeo sent a note. Hey, guys, I'm a little late on this announcement, but I passed my CFI check ride late May this year. Congrats. I am just now getting enough time to refresh my malnourished penguins with some episodes of OB. <laughs> Thanks for all you do for the aviation community. Thanks especially for the Lean on Me episode. It was especially timely out this way. Talk soon. Kilo Romeo from the Wind Tunnel Delta. We're going to talk a little bit about more, more about that today, too. And another feedback. Uh, yes. And you want to get number three? Number three. Uh, let me scroll back up as I was. Sorry, I'll get it. Putting No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I got it. I'm there. Uh, from Patron Whiskey Mike. Hi, RHNAG. Started listening to the show a few months ago while working through Instrument. I'm excited to say that I just completed my check ride out of the president who wore the top hat airport under Metroplex Bravo last Friday. Okay, With congrats. friendly triad area DPE golf hotel and i'm now instrument rated awesome congratulations very good uh i enjoy the humor and lighthearted approach to demystifying atc keep up the good work and in celebration i finally blew the dust off my card and joined as a patron cool thanks thank you for your support and welcome to patreon we have evidence to support this theory if you show up to a check ride with some merch on from ob merch it could go a long way in your oral there are not just that you're wearing it, <laughs> but you will know the answers mm-hmm. to the questions. Mm-hmm. You will dazzle the DPE, <laughs> dazzling DPEs since 2018. Peter, put that in the show title suggestions, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Dazzling DPE since 2018. I Is love it. Is that the date? Is that when we started? We started in 2018. 18, right in the beginning the of The first Monday of 2018 was episode one. Mm-hmm. Straight into a Monday. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, let's brag about that for a second. We haven't. We might not have put it out every seven days, but we have not missed the increment of weekly for s- six and a half years. Yeah, so on the times when we can't do a show during that week, we record two. Mm-hmm. You know, the week prior. Mm-hmm. And then the show gets put out. Or if we really want to cause a buzz, we don't do anything until like Thursday. And it's for that week and people freak out. What happened yes. to them? <laughs> yep. They start to get like twitchy and. <laughs> Are they okay? Yeah. Uh, I think I hit my music and didn't say timely feedback. Hold on. You didn't. We skipped that. Just say it. <laughs> timely feedback. <laughs> timely feedback. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, this is going to be rough. All right. Which one do you want here? Um, I'll just... I can... Uh, two is long. Mm. So I'll do one. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> Patron pops here. Good morning, gentlemen. Another absolute cracker of an episode. As always, uh, a few times recently, you've mentioned this horrifying practice <laughs> of... Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what we were talking about here. Uh, the New York area making jets fly at bug smasher altitudes for sometimes hundreds of miles. Yes. Well, I complained about how that was how I got home a couple of times now. Right. Mm-hmm. I believe this innovation, <laughs> in quotations, is called Sermon. 
Uh, who doesn't love a good nested acronym? <laughs> nested, too. I like that. Uh-huh. Each of the letters has their own acronym. Because why not? Oh. It does have... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the sw- swap <laughs> nested acronym. I didn't put that together. <laughs> It's acronyms within acronyms. All right, S E R M N. What's the S? Okay, the S is swap, which is S W A P. <laughs> Come on, man. F A A G S. <laughs> the Severe Weather Avoidance Program Escape Routes Metro New York. That's what this all stands for. There is an argument on that, um, if that's true, because I've heard of a different way, and I don't remember what it was, but it was from a dispatcher friend. I don't remember him explaining this with those words, but it was the same idea. It's a planned escape route out of the area because of usually weather. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The name suggests these were originally created for weather, but as you said on the show, they've been activating these procedures for other reasons. Uh, There's a link to this. Uh, notice Mm -hmm. and this particular one says due to staffing at the center Uh, let's see a tiny bit more info okay so there's a couple more links uh, about the procedures if you're going northbound or southbound (laughs) pop sierra continues such a hot mess (laughs) nothing beats flying (laughs) teetaboro all the way to raleigh at 8,000 feet pop sierra yeah that's terrible well, I mean, you probably double, maybe not double the burn, but interesting you bring that up. I had okay. I, I had a dispatcher friend do this specifically for one of their smaller planes that might be subject to this type of route and escape mechanism. So instead of going up into the twenties where jets like to be on an hour flight like this, where they burn normal amounts of gas, they're keeping them at six or eight thousand feet, and then never letting them come up, which is my problem. Once you get past. DC, right. you should be able to climb, and they don't. Yeah. They don't, no one even thinks of it as an option anymore. You're what? you're stuck down. There. Yeah, you're not going up. Why? A great question. That's the part I complain about. Whoever made these up, good on you. The math worked out where it was like seven hundred dollars more in gas. They would rather spend that money than be canceled. I get that. But when they came up with these, someone should have said, "All right, how far away from New Jersey do we have to be?" Before we can go back up into normal places. And nobody said it. Nobody's doing it. I don't get it. Man, uh, you know, you're going to eventually get into what is air traffic no man's land. Mm-hmm. There's nothing out happening <laughs> out there. Nothing. Just climb. Even if it was to the, your, your highest altitude to let you go to was the lowest on an arrival going into D.C., which doesn't arguably doesn't have as much traffic as the New York area. But let's just say that was the argument. Well, they can't because the arrivals in Washington. Yeah, not 40 miles away. Right. You could still go up. There's a there's a way to do that. Yeah. No, we just can't cross you out with yeah, any. We can't. Tra- there's traffic uh, above you somewhere. Yeah. So we can't we can't cross you out. Somebody that's working up there, please. If you are along that route, you are from the northeast to the southwest, planes going south, southwest, and you have these jets flying down below 10. Right. Like, let's just say it's an American Airlines flight at 8,000 feet to Raleigh. Hmm, this is weird. That is super weird. (laughs) What's he doing down here? Do you want to hire? Are you requesting 8,000? No. We (laughs) We got stuck down here. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I can't climb you. I can't do it. I can't put an amendment in. plane. At 9 or 10 or 11. All right. Let's put it in a triad perspective. You get one of these weirdo planes, and it's going to Atlanta, pretty far away from us. Yeah. He's at 10,000. What's your first question going to be? Is this your altitude? Is this... Do you want higher? No, I want higher. I I do not like this. I object. Okay. I want to go higher. Climb, maintain 1, 2,000. I'll work on higher. Okay. Then what do you do? Climb him to the top of my airspace. Okay. Amend it to... Oh, you want 27? Here you go. <laughs> Amend it to 270. Call the center. Center triad APREC. Yep. And they're going to take him. Yeah. They're going to take him. Yeah. So-and-so was at, left at 10. I don't know why he wants 
mm-hmm. 260, 270. Okay. Sometimes the center might even say, climb him, start him to 230, put him on, you know, radar contact. Yeah. Okay, here he goes. You just busted Liberty's airspace, but that's okay. Dang We're it. not paying attention. <laughs> 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 I remembered something from air traffic. Yay. <laughs> All right, number two from Patron Sierra Delta, RH and AG. Sorry for the long rambling. So I didn't ask you. Are you done with number one? I. Uh, yeah, I think so. All right. Pops here. Yeah, from Pops here. Yeah. Sorry for the long ramblings of an old, crusty, retired warrant officer. I understand if you see the word count and don't bother reading. I've set up filters to ignore most of these that go over a certain word count. I won't tell you what it is, but we let this one through. We did. In episode 340, AG gave a good description of the mental health challenge of flying, especially in combat, and the change we go through from being a young, dumb, new pilot. I'm a lucky smartphones didn't exist in Korea in the 80s. <laughs> We're both lucky that phones didn't, smartphones didn't exist for really up until our 20s. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To being an old crusty warrant officer, I don't want to claim I did, I did anything heroic on my deployment. Okay. As an ash and trash lawn dart pilot. Have you ever heard that? Yes. There was a issue that... The 60s had with their stabilator in the back that programs automatically uh, based on airspeed. And at high speeds, it was programming uh, to the wrong position hmm. and causing the, a, a pretty bad nosedive. Depending on your altitude, this could be. <laughs> or most helicopters hang out below 1,000 yeah, feet. Yeah. It really could be. bad. Yeah. <laughs> So that's how they got the, that's how they got that name. To paraphrase the movie, Mr. Roberts, <laughs> my flights went from tedium to boredom with an occasional side trip to monotony. <laughs> we avoided build up areas and towns in Iraq. So our one to 20, 250,000 ratio maps were just brown paper <laughs> flying 50 feet off the deck in 120 degrees heat, no air conditioning, wearing a flak vest with chicken plate shoving frozen bottles of water under our fa- flak vest to try and stay cool. Everything covered in a fine sand. I quickly found war is a young man's quote unquote game. In spite of never being shot at that I know of, there were reminders of our mortality and the capricious and finicky nature of fate in war. The black spot where a Marine Huey was shot down. Another spot where a fellow IP was killed teaching NVG dust landings. Man, as AG will tell you, those are a hoot. <laughs> yeah. As with AG, I was a National Guard unit. The positive side was we were mostly older, experienced pilots. The downside was that we were mostly older. <laughs> As an IP, I was overtasked. Standards never stops. Chronic fatigue became a real issue. Wake up, draw weapons, brief the mission, fly the mission, plan tomorrow's mission, eat, dinner, sleep, wake up, draw weapons, fly day after day. Week after week, month after month, taking 800 milligram, quote unquote, army candy Motrin (laughs) before and after missions, needing the crew chief to help me out after nine hours of flying. I remember on one occasion when I had flown 14 days straight for hard, long days. Those are really hard. That's a really hard 14 days. Yep. We were supposed to get a day off every six days, but I was the only IP instructor pilot, correct? Mm -hmm. due to injuries and IPs on rest and recreation. As I finished day 14 mission, I was looking forward to just hiding in my hooch and escaping reality by binge watching episodes of the Sopranos on my laptop. What a great way to waste like a week. If you, if you had nothing to be accountable for, (laughs) yeah, find this somewhere on streaming and just hit play. Yeah. The, what is it? Warrant officer one. Yeah, I W1. Was tra- uh, W1, uh, I was training, went to ops to turn our secure gear while I went to our company to debrief. Oddly, my acting commander and the flight surgeon were there. I found out why after the Whiskey One showed up. He was all happy and bubbly. Great news, he said. <laughs> we're on the mission board for tomorrow, and we're flight lead. Yay. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> He continues, I almost started crying. 
I had been doing this for months with no break and was due for my R&R in a couple of weeks. My CL went first. We really need you to flight lead tomorrow. Then the flight doc chimed in. You're good to go, right? Of course I was. Not only was I flying the next day, but I had to plan the mission. Tony Soprano would have to wait. (laughs) Coming home at the end of my tour was surreal. On a Saturday, I took off a Penguin Airlines 747 from quote, no drinking or fun, <laughs> international airport, and landed the next day at Camp Swampy. <laughs> yep. Monday, I started out, out processing and drinking and drinking. On Wednesday, I got out processing station and was handed an airline ticket and told, welcome home. That evening, I got home and hung up my uniform. That was it. I had 30 days of leave, so I spent each day having lunch with my kids at their school and, well, doing nothing. Each evening with my wife came home, looked at the honeydew list of things I needed to get done before going to work as an airline pilot and noticed with increasing alarm that nothing had been done. Eventually, she sat me down and said I needed to talk to someone. I didn't want a health professional, as you pointed out, that would put me in a bind, lie on my medical or risk losing my job. So I started meeting over lunch with a friend and minister who helped me through that dark time. Again, I want to emphasize that I did nothing heroic or traumatic On my deployment, I actually feel guilty when I walk by the nearby military ceremony and see the Garden of Stones or those killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, knowing I did so little and feel guilty. I can't read the rest of that. All right. Many of them were so young, they just started living. Keep up the great work with your show, and if you've gotten this far, I hope I didn't put you to sleep. Sarah Roman Delta, no, you you didn't put us to sleep. Um, and the idea that <clears throat> you had to get shot at or do something, uh, quote unquote, heroic to, to be considered that is untrue. You're going over and doing these and doing this deployment is no small task at all. Um, when I came back from my Iraq deployment, which looking back on it was seemed easier than my Afghanistan deployment. I, there is, there was like a period of time post deployment when I was home during that leave time, which was like, for me, it was a month, about a month and a half that I, I don't really remember. I remember coming home and I remember doing some of the stuff, but there are things my wife says that I was doing during that time that I have no recollection of at all. It is a really, really tough transition to come back from. Uh, So hats off to you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you did. Uh, It is, it was very, very important and it it is heroic. It is. Um, So thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And thank you for sharing the story and your your wife suggesting, hey, you know, maybe she didn't mean you had to go to the health professional. Maybe she mean you got to do something. You got to talk to somebody. And you found the right people to speak to, hopefully, and that helped. Um, and that's not something you have to disclose on your medical. That's where this is all coming from is you do take that risk. All right, if I go talk to somebody, what if there is something, quote unquote, wrong with me or they they think I need help or some sort of medication That's a risk, and you don't want to take that. We understand that. And pilots and controllers are both subject to that line on the medical, which is still in place, despite some of the rule changes actually occurring now. Um, It's still a long road out there before you're not faced with that fork in the road. Do do, Do I go this way and risk not being able to get a medical again and may arguably getting a different, more effective treatment for what is happening? Or do I turn to the non-medical route, minister, friend, another family member, someone else who's been through this, or an email to guys like us reading on the show, somewhat therapeutic maybe? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, just getting it out there. Uh, But, you know, in your case, just finding somebody to talk to uh, can be super helpful. Anybody else that's out there dealing with that kind of stuff? Um, We've said it before. We'll keep saying it. Find somebody to talk to. Maybe that's all you need. 
Thank, so, thank you, Sierra Roma Delta. You want, yep. number, you want number three? Number three, from patron Sierra Whiskey Hay Opposing Bases as a new patron member and longtime listener, I felt that it was my duty to perform this review with absolute honesty. I enjoy your content immensely, and it has helped me in so many ways. I, however, would be remiss from mentioning my absolute disagreement with you, with your constant callouts, <laughs> to not listen to your podcast while I am flying. <laughs> Having... Having flown many types of aircraft, from the lowly Cessna 150 to the mighty queen of the skies, those flights would be absolutely monotonous <laughs> without your sultry voices in my ear. Not to mention the fact uh, that something you say could directly impact my flight. So from this mighty sim pilot sitting in the back waiting for the in-flight fish to strike the cockpit, <laughs> I hope you change your minds about this advice. In all honesty, your show has been amazing. I was finally able to get a third class medical and have started my training and keep all these perspectives in mind when navigating the NAS Sierra Whiskey. Uh, okay. If you are hearing my voice right now in your airplane, okay, you are in your airplane flying, in charge of flying the airplane. That last call might have been for you. <laughs> pay, pay attention. Uh, okay. I like Sarah the... Whiskey. Oh, God. No. The, Go ahead. The in-flight fish to strike. Every private pilot's dream is that someday they will be needed in the cockpit of an airliner. Just so you know, I'm back here. You know, keep turning left and saying that. The pilots get a kick out of that. I haven't had that happen on this airline yet. <laughs> But it did happen at my last one at least once. Yeah. It was a joke. They were joking. Yeah. Hey, there's a pilot back here in case you need anything. All right, thanks. <laughs> you never know. You never know when someone's going to say, hey, we need you to just sit up here and run some checklists for us. You never know. I'll just put it that way. I mean, yeah. Hey. Uh, but people give the, the guys that say that to the pilots a bad time. Who cares? Yeah. Don't give them a bad time. Yeah. Come on. Come on. They might fly once or twice a year. They they want you to know they're a pilot. They feel like they're part of the community. Let them say it. Come on. They are part of the community. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Not like they yeah. shouldn't feel that way, but right. they've got a piece of paper in their wallet that says they're a pilot, and they want you to know that. Good for them. And they know way more about what's going on mm -hmm. than 95% mm -hmm. of, the, of the people on board that plane. Yes. Ha who have zero idea. So they shut happening. the shades, they turn on their movie, and they ignore... Put me in this box and tell me when we're there. <laughs> right. Right. All right, fancy jet music. Fancy jet music. Take it away, AG. This week's show topic brought to you by patron... SCAC patron, Sierra Echo who sent a uh, a couple links to a report about an incident that happened in, when was this? May of 22. Recent. Yeah, pretty recent. In Europe. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in Europe. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, it involves incorrect altimeter settings and the resulting near miss with the earth. Due to that, due to that incorrect setting, uh, which, okay, anyway, we'll just we'll get into it. Um, this is from Sierra Echo. Hello there. I have attached a link to a final report for the incident where an Airbus A320 descended to within six feet of the ground. Six feet. Yeah, that would have hit my head. Hit me in the head. The wheels smack, blow my hat right off my head. All right. Uh, six to the ground during an LNAV approach into an airport in Europe. In uh, This was May of 22. Yeah. The pilots received an incorrect altimeter setting from ATC, different than what they heard on the ADAs, and flew the LNAV approach to the runway using Barrow uh, VNAV. Minimums. 
The nature of these approaches combined with an erroneous altimeter setting result in the aircraft flying what looked like a perfect profile with everything appearing normal to the pilots, except they were 280 feet lower than they should have been throughout the approach. Okay, so I'm going to guess, based on that, 280, which is almost 300 feet, which is about what a three-degree glide slope is per mile, Mm -hmm. 300 feet per mile, that almost a mile from the runway. 0.9, according to the video. 0.9 miles from the runway is where they almost... Where they were given a low altitude alert, yep, and sent around, basically. Yes. Yep. That's where they would have impacted planet Earth. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, a ground proximity warning from the tower controller saved the day at the last possible moment. I, yeah, maybe. It doesn't feel like, it doesn't sound like that was what happened. Yeah, right. It doesn't feel like that when you listen to it, uh, but maybe. And there was some, that was a point of contention in the investigation is the controller's phraseology was wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and that potentially led to the pilots not really paying attention to it right and they were also getting some conflicting audio from the plane itself thinking that it was a time to land right and airbus audio starts coming out with a 50-foot call right and a instruction to retard the throttle which would have been mind-boggling confusing right or and they were terrible and, uh, t- and terrible yes so why uh, why they decided to go around, I'm guessing maybe they saw it. You know, they're maybe. close enough now. You're six feet off the ground. I got to believe you could see something. I agree with you. So anyway, Sierra Echo continues this incident and the recommendations that followed are going to be studied in top for a long time. They are. And so here we are. We're mm-hmm. we're taking a look at it. <clears throat> it is a chill, which is why, you know, when something like this happens, we don't really talk about it then. We don't You're speculate. Right. Well, let's wait. And look how long it's taken. It's been over two years, mm-hmm. two and a half years almost, <clears throat> that it took for this report to come out. And now we'll talk about it because the data is in, the facts are in, right? It is a chilling reminder that without positive vertical guidance from an external source, from either a glide slope signal or from GPS, the LNAV approach is vulnerable to a very bad outcome with the wrong L timber setting. I found it eye opening digging into details of this incident regards here. So I've left, there are links in the show notes to uh, where these reports are. There's a video, uh, a link to a YouTube video that basically gives a summary of the thing. Um, I, I just put that in there. Okay. And uh, what else is in there? Anyway, uh, you can go check those out. It is, uh, it is pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the report came out with some initial recommendations for the controllers and for the pilots. I'll do the controller ones if you want to do the pilots and talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, all right, so number one, ensure controllers are aware of the importance of altimeter settings. I think that's probably generally true. I think controllers understand, mm-hmm. like, hey, if the thing is off, you know, this much 280 feet that could potentially be a serious problem Mm -hmm. uh especially during approaches with low visibility that's where this becomes a problem you're getting close to the ground i still can't see the ground and i think that i'm 280 feet higher than i am that is a problem Mm -hmm. that's how this something like this happens all right uh so what that means for the controller side is you're going to have a class you're going to have a briefing you're going to have something you got to go you know, watch, listen, click through, whatever. All right. Uh, number two, ensure controllers understand the importance of getting a correct readback. So here we go on this, on the readback thing, right? So there's a, there are still pilots out there that, you know, are willing to just say Roger. Or when I, when they check in and I give them the altimeter, they just say their call sign. You know, uh, 99 out of a hundred times, probably no factor. Mm-hmm. They probably right, got it right. 10, 20 feet. Who, it really won't make that big of a difference. Yeah, it won't. And <laughs> that's a phrase that is occasionally uttered in the Tracon. What's 10 feet among friends, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if they read it back wrong or something like that. Um, 
uh, of course, that's a joke. But uh, if it's this far off, and we're going to talk about that, 280 feet. That's a long way. Yeah. That's a long, long way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number three, ensure controllers use standard phraseology concerning minimum safe altitude warnings. Um, and I, I forget the exact way that the controller says it in here, but he said something like, I'm getting a low altitude for you or mm. something to that effect. Yeah, it was, and it was untimely. So it sounded like they were, huh, you, I'm not sure if you're in the right spot or not. This seems like this could be an erroneous alert that I'm getting. Right. Hey, are you okay out there? Yep. As their ma the mental math is happening. So put yourself in that situation. The airplane is on a mile final at Triad. And their altitude shows 900. At, which is the field elevation. <laughs> that is bad. But that would... You're not really thinking that way as a tower controller looking at that. You're not really doing that math the whole time is what I'm getting at. Yeah, right. Until they're at a mile or maybe two, someone might notice it. You're not going to notice it. Right. So You know, I used to have a thing printed out that showed at every mile Where they marker, should be. What the glide slope altitude was. That should be up in the tower. I don't know where that went. It should be up there so people know what looks funny. Yeah. Yeah, it should. I mean, it wasn't. A, it's not like it was some kind of science that I did. I, I just drew the thing out and, you know, went backwards yeah. from from the missed altitude. Or All the right. Decision what what is the correct phraseology? I'm flying. I'm on a mile final. Low altitude alert. Airbus one two three. Check your altitude immediately. It used to say. It used to want you to say, uh, the. The MDA or decision height right. is whatever. Because but now it just says. If you're, whether or not you're established on final or something dictates the next move. Yeah. The altimeter or um, um, Man, the MVA. MVA. Right. Right. Yep. Right. Telling this pilot the minimum vectoring altitude is, in our case, a triad 2,500 feet at that point. Great. That's right. like 1,400 feet above me or 2,400 feet above me right now. Right. Who cares? Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> exactly. Who cares? It, 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 it's so dumb. I don't. That one I don't understand. The altimeter one. That makes sense. That may have really saved made the day a here. But you waited too long. Like right. you, six feet is too long for mm -hmm. the pilots to be going. Oh, oh, the altimeter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Uh, number four. Implement a procedure that mitigates this risk by adding additional altimeter setting during the approach. Okay. So that's just saying at some other point along the approach after the approach clearance, I, I would not do it with the approach clearance. No, because now we're just piling so much garbage into the approach clearance. You're, I, I can say this, my experience in Europe is that they are compared to the U S far more open to saying it several times. I'll put it that way. You okay. hear it more. You hear it out of context a little bit more often. Mm. From my U.S. experienced brain, I feel like I hear it more over there. They are okay. They are totally fine giving it to you several times. Right. So that's probably partially a, a result of this. Perhaps. Yeah. It could be. Incident. Yeah. It yeah. totally could be. Yeah. Uh, my turn. Yes. All right. From the pilot side. Uh, ensure the pilots understand the importance of the altimeter settings for certain types of approaches. I think they do. I will say I did not understand that this could be an internal source in the airplane that is saying for this RMP on nav approach that it's not looking at anything else. It's not getting a, a glide slope signal from the ground. We know that it's not an ILS and it's not coming from a GPS satellite. It's built in the airplane's database, which we have a bunch of buttons. We have to make sure, um, uh, are in alignment with what's required for that approach. Um, I could go down a wormhole on that. I'll sound uneducated. I don't want to, but the system is has to be pretty accurate for us to do those approaches. But okay. it, if it relies on this altimeter setting, be input to the computer that I'm using. Yep. I didn't realize how important that was until reading this article. So that this is a case of a garbage in, garbage out yes. kind of scenario, right? Yes. You put the wrong thing in. It doesn't know just, that. Right. It doesn't it know. It doesn't know what the altimeter setting is. Correct. 
Right. When you check in with a Tricon controller, presumably within 60 miles, the altimeter setting shouldn't change that much, 60 miles from an airport. You're down in the land of not 2992 or 1013 in Europe. You're putting in a local altimeter setting, which I think is a risk over there. You do that much lower, usually below 7,000. Flight levels are at least to 7,000 there. So huh. it's you're closer to the airport before you get this local setting. Just throwing that out there as a reason to just join the rest of us in the U.S. and go up to 18, but I don't want to go off on that. Okay. Um, if you check in and you're at, say, you, these altimeter settings were off by about 300 feet. When you check in to this Tracon controller, you're still on, in Europe, you're still on the 2992 equivalent. When you get down and they give you a new setting, some there's enough time in the 7,000, 6,000 foot strata where you're in feet now that someone should notice, hey, you're you're telling me you're at six and I'm showing you at 5,700 feet. That should have happened. Right. The altimeter reading was probably done a couple other times before this and it was input incorrectly. I believe the video shows that the correct altimeter was 1011 hectopascals. They had 1001 in their machine in there all the we have three in my airplane um a backup and two digitals that that's being put in and we have a couple points that's my next point on here uh cross check the altimeter with another source we cross check all three fo captain and the standby uh passing when we go down through 18 when we get onto a local altimeter setting we do it again at 2500 feet um above the ground 2500 feet agl we have another one now, I will admit that I feel like that's more of a cross-check to make sure we're all in the same one. And I I can't say for sure that I've always gone back and said, hey, what did we print out the ATIS? It comes out of a little computer with a printer. I can't say that I always look at that and see if it's really close or not. Yeah. I'd like to think I do. <laughs> but the final check, and this is what I had to put in there today, when you get to a final approach fix altitude, roughly 1,500 feet above the ground on most every approach in the world, it's about that. If you cross that fix, which you can see on a moving map, and you're showing 1,200 feet, something's wrong. Yeah. And that's the last check. And in right. this case, would have saved them from starting down this imaginary made up glide slope that the computer made up. At the, at, you know, being 300 feet below the entire time. They ran a perfect vertical navigation profile paralleling. Yeah, started a mile early. <laughs> yes. Well, they were never at that altitude. It might have started at the same point uh, laterally of them descending. They were level, 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 300 feet below. They get to the final approach fix, start going down. They were just underneath it the whole time. Okay, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but, right. So, okay. Someone in the tower or the radar facility should have noticed, hey, your secondary transponder is telling me you're at 1,200 feet. Yeah, you're 300 feet low. Why are you Why, why are you there? Right. I wonder if that's discovered in here. I didn't read the whole, uh, the whole write-up yet, but I'm, I'm curious. You... Go ahead. I'm curious if that was part of it. Like how, somebody didn't look back and go, wait a second. Were they always in a descent? Because that's another trap. That, that is what I was going to say. How is, how is this continuous descent mentality playing into, I don't, get, I don't have an opportunity. Right, because you're not level. You're never level. Right. So I check in, I'm, one point, or I'm, I'm 6.7 descending 4,000. And the, and the controller sees 6.5, 6.4, and they're like, oh, by the time the words came out of their mouth. Yeah, there's a delay in the whole thing. Yeah, they're, they're already through the altitude. Everything's okay. Again, I'm making another argument that higher up in the strata, you should be determining when pilots get on a local setting. This is a really good explanation of why it would have helped. Yeah, and, and they, a level off somewhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get the, I get the continuous descent mentality. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, but if that was what was happening here, and I don't know, but I know, like going into London, right? You're, you yeah. have to do. You you do get level in the hold. You do wait. 
So there's an opportunity for them to see you level in nine out of 10 approaches there. If it's early and they're landing east and you, you may never stop. You may never. Even even at a, a local altimeter setting or are you still on? Good point. No, you're right. Good point. It's lower than that. You're right. You're still on one that'll match because I don't understand how their radar is processing that because the way triads altimeter set up is to interact with the mode with your transponder is it's automatically taking the altimeter setting from a source. Do you know where that source is? Where is our scope at Triad getting its altimeter that changes automatically? We don't change that. No, it's from it's from the um, not the WSP. It's from the ASOS. Okay. Yeah. But it changes automatically. We don't go in and manually do it every hour. Yeah. Years ago, I don't know if I told you the story, one of the new controllers at the facility they were at, it didn't do it automatically. They had to do it every hour. Oh and my he gosh. knew the key command. So he went in and he changed the altimeter setting in the scope. And I made a, a very loud stink. Yeah. Alarms went off in my head. I said, whatever you just did, you have to go back to the way it was. I don't know what you did, but you can't do that. He said, what are you talking about? And for him, it was normal. I'm right. like, this is automatic. You can't do that. The next controller won't change it. It'll be on that forever. Yeah. It'll never get touched. Yeah. And a hurricane will come through and it all will of our be pilots will be reading. Three nothing will be three. right. Yeah. Stop. Jeez. Oh, so we got somebody tech ops in the room. They fixed it. They went back to automatic. And I don't think he understood it at the time. I don't think he listens to the show, but I was, I got visibly upset about it. Not because yeah. he had done some new procedure that I'd never seen, but he could, that could kill people. Yeah. Right. Yes. We could drive you right into a hill. Yep. Because everything looks pretty because we're not using the right altimeter. But anyway, that's that's a side point. There are checks that the pilots probably didn't do on the way to cross-check the plate. So the, for GA guys that are wondering, hey, how do I avoid this? You're probably not doing an RMP that has an internal system like this. You're probably getting a GPS glide slope or an ILS glide slope that's external. And that, that's true. That's going to be... It really doesn't matter what your altimeter says. This case, in this study, it does. Make sure you're matching it up. When you cross the final approach fix, you know, all the things, time turn, twist, throttle talk, all the things you get taught how to do, look at your altimeter. Make sure you're at the right place. If you're 300 feet below what the fix says you're supposed to be at, when the glide slope comes in, yep. red flags. Right. Should start waving in your head. Something's right. wrong. Yeah. Because even though you're getting an external source, it could, if the visibility is bad enough, it could matter at the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It could matter. Mm -hmm. You think you're at 200 feet mm -hmm. and you're not. Absolutely. You're six feet off the ground. This one's uh, over the runway. I agree know. with Sierra Echo. This one is eye opening. Um, this would have a different outcome, obviously, if they, if they crashed. Everybody would be confused. What did the pilots do? What did air traffic do? And it, it seems like it's awkward that this hasn't happened more often, knowing how so, easy it is. Yeah, so it is hard for – this kind of a scenario is hard for – we were talking about it at work um, yesterday, where in the U.S., once a center guy, usually a center controller, gives you an altitude, assigns you an altitude below flight level 180, they give you the altimeter setting, the local altimeter setting, all right? Mm -hmm. So – on that, it, on your descent, before you get into Tracon land, you've already been given an altimeter setting. When you get into Tracon land and they give you another altimeter setting or you get the ATIS, and, and in our world, that's where the pilot would put in another setting and it would be two, almost 300 feet off. Okay. All right. And the pilot would go, uh... And why would they do that? Let me tell you why. <laughs> because the, the airplane, depending on what type of automation you're using, you would have to tell it how to get to that new altitude. 300 feet off, it wouldn't just work its way back up. Right. In out hold, which altitude hold is a, it's keeping the same barometric pressure. Somebody could tell me it's doing something fancy. I don't know. It's just, it's magic. It won't know what to do if you do 300 feet. It's not going to like, oh, let me see if I can sneak back up here and they won't notice that I'm doing a 300 <laughs> foot per minute climb. No, it's <laughs> it's going to be stuck there and it you're going to be mismatched. And it that would trigger the pilot to go, wait a second. 
we just rolled this thing 300 feet, which is a long way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? What happened here? Yeah. What is the altimeter setting again? And the, a crew environment, you would hope that, that got caught. But again, I'm back to my soapbox about the, they wait forever in Europe to give you the local altimeter setting. It's super low, super close to the airport. Less, and it's, less opportunity to see it. And it's in a descent. And it is in a descent. Yes. And so it doesn't, it's hard to like make that correlation. And, and if, you know, in the States, you, you could conceivably have from 2992, you could be off. Well, you know, what are we talking? Like 3020, that's 280 feet mm-hmm. off of 2992. That's totally conceivable that that would happen. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. But then oh, yeah. somewhere else, you're going to get it again mm-hmm. and go, whoa. Something's not right here. Yeah. What happened? Right. Now, I, there are, you are level over there. You're not always in a descent. So there's, it's, London presents an interesting scenario. It's probably the most um, strict about it. But the other places you do level off. Okay. Um, what else? I don't know. It's just a, it does seem hard to fathom, you know, that that would. Plus, between the tower and the and the whoever's working final, a guy being three hundred feet low, like you're going, you you vectored them. They got established on final, and there's a few miles where they're just level. The playback on the video shows that shows where so, they are. I right. and, and you know we usually tell them three thousand. Then depending on which runway they're going to, maybe they stay at three. Maybe they go to twenty eight, but mm-hmm. there's there there isn't any that if they were for miles at twenty five hundred, mm-hmm. I'm going. Uh, what are you doing? Yeah, what's happening? Yeah, it's and an maybe RP I'm too to, maybe I'm too busy working final to notice it, but the tower you would think would notice it when they check in. I'm like, uh, do you think, uh, in, in general, not to disparage their knowledge, but do you think in general people would be alerted to a visual without an, uh, without a low altitude alert? Cause eventually those get just like the airplane. As you get closer to an airport, you have to touch the ground. So it stops telling you pull up, pull up. Yeah. So right. It, it doesn't, this one was telling the airplane to basically set itself up for a flare. Yeah. Cause it thought it was going to land. It thought it was in the right place. Um, Right, and that's really that could be very misleading to the pilots if you can't really see outside. Right. Do you think the average controller at Triad would say at four miles, "Hey, this this doesn't something doesn't feel right about this. The math is off." Do, are they once doing, they're inside the final approach fix and descending? Yes. No way. Uh, there will be some that that might. Okay. But no. What about no. at the final approach fix? On ILSs, it's you're in the soup. They cross at twenty six hundred feet. Do you think that would throw? And that shouldn't happen on ILS. Just throwing that out there because they have a, a ground depicted glide slope coming off the ground. But would they notice that? Do you think? Uh, I don't think. I some would. There would be a few that would. Okay. But there would be just as many or more that wouldn't. Pilots, I've noticed that even at this airline, are the same way. Anytime a controller reads out an altimeter setting, we all lean in and do our altimeter. No matter if it's changed or not, we all look at it at least and put our hand close to it. Yeah. So if you're ever in doubt, I'll throw this out to the tower controllers. You can't do the math. You're ever unsure. Throw out an altimeter setting. You could, it could be the only thing that matters at that point. That could be yeah. the defining difference yep. of them dialing in the right one for this specific type of approach that's internally built. We have to preface all this properly. Right, right. Thank you, Sierra Echo. Anything to add to it? Uh, No. Yeah, thanks for sending that in. Um, It was, you know, it's something we haven't really talked about before on the show. So mm-hmm. it's good. All right, moving on. Moving on.
Feedback time. Feedback. These should go relatively quick. Yeah, these are quick. I want the first one. This is funny. Okay. From Patreon Delta Fox, hey guys, much as I'd love to start with a clever joke, this is kind of serious. I finally thought of a sufficient, clever review title to leave my first ever podcast review. More on this later. So once I finally figure out how to navigate to leave a review page on, I could say this name, right? I think so. On Spotify, I quickly notice that if I select fewer than five stars, the submit button disappears. No, no, no. no. If I select fewer than Few- five stars, yeah, the so button appears. Oh, the button appears. Okay. But yep. the submit button immediately disappears once I select five stars. Photos attached. Now, I looked at these screenshots, and they show, they walked us through it. Yep. Now, I don't know, for the Spotify people out there that know how this was programmed, when you hit that fifth star, did it automatically get sent? And the submit button is an option if you selected something less. Like, oh, are they sure they want to do four stars? Yeah. But why you didn't get a chance to type your words in? Co- correct. That's not good. It's not good at all. So it sounds like they won't let you do a five-star review on the Spotify. Okay, so we need the Spotify people to go. I need you to go confirm this. Mm-hmm. Push pause. It's it's <laughs> the button with the two vertical lines. Okay. You push pause, you go now and try to leave a review. Uh-huh. And then whatever happens, you tell us, hey, it worked. Hey, it didn't work. Yes, mm-hmm. the submit button disappears. If you're in dark mode, it's disappears if you're in because this looked like dark mode. Like maybe the button. You mean normal mode? <laughs> Vampire person mode? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please report back. Yes. Uh, they continue. I ser- sincerely hope this is user error rather than a software glitch. But if I'm right, you won't be getting any five-star reviews from Spotify listeners. End of serious and urgent feedback. Awkward transition to a funny title of my future five-star review. Who put the troll in controller? <laughs> kind regards, Patron Delta Foxtrot. <laughs> uh, uh. Very good. Thank you for the intel. Uh, our attorneys are going to have a field day with this. Scandal. Total yeah, scandal. Yeah, because here's what I'm thinking. I think it's just for our show. I think it is too. And other shows allow you to read, make five, six, even seven star ratings. Ours <laughs> stops at four. <laughs> Maybe we haven't unlocked the five star <laughs> review yet. <laughs> oh right, right. Yeah, we haven't achieved some mm. milestone or accolade. Uh, perhaps. Thank you, Delta Foxtrot. A Delta Foxtrot is. I'm, I think I'm getting this. This is PayPal Delta Foxtrot, isn't it? I believe uh, in the chat room. I believe. Okay. That's okay. Either way. All right. All right, you get number two. Number two from Patron <laughs> India Mike. Thought I'd share the view of Catalina Island. Alpha Victor X-ray Airport is called the airport in the sky because some days the runway sits just above the cloud tops. Bison were almost gone from the <laughs> island years ago and are slowly making a comeback. And apparently are now <laughs> the numbers are now dwindling because the hundred dollar burger is actually a bison. <laughs> India, Mike. Uh, the picture. I have the picture, it's picture up now. It's, it's, um, I'm putting it up now. It's pretty crazy. It really is like a, up on top, tabletop. You can actually see some clouds, just a thin Yeah, my mouse. There. Can you see my little mouse moving uh-huh. there? Yep. That is the, uh, the, the runway. What a cool um, downwind approach. I think this airport has some... Uh, pretty easy to follow noise abatement times of the day. They don't want you flying in too early. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually saw that on a YouTube video. They were all, they got to the inside the FBO and they were, I think they were inside the FBO before they were technically supposed to have landed based on the <laughs> noise abatement time. But so an approach like this can be kind of tricky visually. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it isn't necessarily real easy. We used to practice doing approaches to sp- into space and put the runway floating in the air in the sim mm. at like 10,000 feet. Mm-hmm. That is not an easy approach no. to make. Right. This is, and this is kind of similar to that. So mm-hmm. pretty cool. 
Yeah, if you if you, say you're, uh, it looks like you're on a left, maybe t- climb out. Maybe this is after you left. It looks like you're pitched up. Um, and the the video I've seen is a right down one, the opposite direction of what you're headed now, where you're kind of coming in with on a right base, and you spend time with terrain coming up to you on final. That's also weird. Yes. Did you have any helicopter landings on terrain like that? Where? Oh yeah. How weird is that? It is weird because it makes it feel like even if you're level, <laughs> like you're descending, which you kind of are. Yeah. But you're well, not. The terrain is just rising into you. It's visually very. What is yeah. your right? Is do you get any altitude readouts from your radar altimeter? That are yes. Yeah, of- that starts to become pretty accurate below fifteen hundred. Okay. Yep. Uh, you basically really have to pay attention to, and I know I've said this on the show before, and everyone thought I was totally crazy. Maybe it's not an airplane thing. We called it the circle of action, where you're on a descent, mm-hmm. a visual approach. It's the point on the runway or wherever it is you're trying to go mm-hmm. that doesn't appear to be moving to you. Okay. All right. You need to adjust your angle until that point is where you want it to be. That's the same for fixed wing. Okay. Yeah, your aim point on the runway should be in the same spot on the windshield the entire yeah. time. It has no apparent movement. Correct. Okay, that... Just like traffic when you're about to hit it. It's not moving. Yes. You're merging. Oh. Yeah. Oh, look <laughs> at that guy. <laughs> He's just hovering there. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> Uh, All right, cool. cool. Yeah, cool airport. I'm going to stop sharing that and put our screen back. Uh, number three is audio from patron Delta Bravo Charlie. I'm going to have play when you are. One, two, three. Gentlemen, I had a quick question about our neighbors to the north. I've recently acquired a reason to fly from just north of the Edgar Allan Poe Bravo to just north of the Cheesehead Charlie. And although this flight manages to cross about 700 miles without touching a single Charlie or Bravo airspace, it does cut across a small piece of Canada near the Motor City, which appears to be controlled by an American center. Although I fly across that spot frequently for work, honestly, I fly an Airbus. And as soon as the tug drops us, we just hit the go up button. And then we enjoy a view unobstructed by flashing carnival lights and steering wheels, and then hit the go down button a little while later. <laughs> I let the lawyers worry about flying across somebody else's country. But can I, as a Part 91 pilot in my little tail dragger, fly across that space? Can I dip my toes in that syrup? <laughs> Thanks for your help. <laughs> I like that. that. syrup. Uh, no, you cannot. And we have your information mm-hmm. and... We have reported you to the Canadian authorities uh-huh. who are now authorized to shoot you down the next time you <laughs> enter Canadian airspace. <laughs> uh, no, I think so. I had uh, a buddy that worked at uh, Detroit, Tricon. He's no longer there. But he said it was totally normal to vector planes, GA or not. Mm-hmm into Canada on the downwind. Um, So, and and there was no coordination happening. I think you're right. The center, you know, just has a little chunk. Um, And the Tracon may own some of that too. I don't know how it's delineated, but Mm -hmm. I think that's totally uh, above board. Yeah. VFR or IFR procedures for you to cross that GA, they're in place for you to land in Canada. And, you know, they, someone knows you're coming. It's, it's all part of following the correct type of flight plan. You can go through customs. But without getting off the plane and just going through airspace, it's with assuming between friendly countries. This is yep. different in parts of the world. Uh, yes. Uh, so let's assume friendly countries, no wars happening. No one, No one's losing any sleep over a boundary crossing in the middle of a flight. Right. Provided you're talking to air traffic. Now, if you were up there squawking 1200 and you wanted to play zigzag across the borders, somebody might wonder what's going on. Fair? <laughs> yes. 
Uh, but if they know who you are and they're talking to you and they know where you're going, this yeah, is an you're not landing. This, yeah. And that's what's happening to you in the in the air in this fancy Airbus with all the fancy side stick and no bells and whistles. No unobstructed or <laughs> no obstructed view. No carnival lights. <laughs> you can't see me, but I just gave you a bowing eye roll. Uh. <laughs> Airbus guys, you know, they, they got their little tray table and they think they're so cool. <laughs> uh, one time I was flying in a, in a non-friendly area of the world and an even unfriendlier uh, nation mm-hmm. state attempted to on guard vector us into their oh. country. Come over here. <laughs> Come on. Hey, you're approaching our border. Wow. Fly heading this to exit the airspace. Heading this was straight <laughs> into the country. Wow. That would have been bad. Mm-hmm. Tricky, tricky. Uh, 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 uh. No, I will not be turning that direction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who gets the last one here? Uh, I'll do it. How about yeah, it? you do I it. I feel like you had to read a lot today. I did read a lot today. All right. Number four from Patron Tango Whiskey. When filing IFR and departing, and the departure procedure takes you northeast, but the arrival procedure takes you northwest, even altitude. It's like our Neod Sweven review here. That's where it came from. Uh, what is the appropriate altitude to file? If I file 11, departing the airport under the Space City Bravo using the GIFA-1 departure, which takes me northeast bound initially, and arrive at an airport under the Cowboy Bravo using the Jaeger-4 arrival, which routes northwest, for flight, an EFB that lets you file through them, complains that 11,000 is an incorrect altitude for this route of flight. You can see below that the route bends at the GIFA intersection, which is roughly halfway along the route. This is a good question. Have we ever talked about this? I don't think so. When a route like when a route line bends like this, what does ATC like to see? I was cleared to and told to expect eleven as my final, but never made it that high. While in vectors out of the Space City Bravo, I was cleared direct to CQI VOR, well along into the Jaeger Four arrival with a heading on the west side of north. So now it would be even. So I amended my top altitude request to ten thousand. Which with ATC, which they granted, we grant you ten thousand. <laughs> you should change the phraseology. That would sound so much cooler. <laughs> Requesting ten thousand, granted. <laughs> but we could have an uh, in memory of James Earl Jones. His voice could be what we say, granted. In oh, you just push a button on yeah. the keyboard and it transmits. <laughs> granted. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's best to do when selecting your cruise altitude in case cases like this where the route could favor either odd or even altitude selections. In this instance, it was roughly 50-50 east and west, and the route is predominantly one or the other. Decision is easier. All right. Uh, my initial thoughts on this are for GA, a departure will usually take you, you know, in a direction for a long time, and try to get off that departure and get onto a heading that's a little bit further out at triad. We would do that. We wouldn't take you out all the way on that. The 11,000 is the problem. And we've said this before, if you file 10 or below, you should stay in Tracon world the whole time. Yeah. Usually. Yep. And not, uh, put you into SOP, which requires a SID. If you file 11 out of triad, you're going to get a SID, right? Yep. Which is silly because, one that's pretty high for ga to be hanging out it takes forever to get there you might not get there until you're well into that airspace so try to stay in the nine to ten range at the highest in this type of flight and that might make the decision easier for atc to give you direct to a fix that precludes this whole question yes if you can't do that and you insist on going to even if it was nine and they and you're not sure i'm going to be back at eight the arrival controller doesn't really care what you filed they're going to have you SOP'd and LOA'd with the other facility on what altitude you come into the airspace on, and it may not match up with direction of flight. Agreed. In yeah. fact, that causes a huge headache for us in the tower every single day yes. for every uh, departure going to Metroplex because they can't be bothered to look at every single jet that goes from Triad to Metroplex gets assigned 13,000. Yes. You dispatchers that are listening to this, they have to go to 13. They have to be 13. Not 14, not 12. 
13 right is the altitude and they'll get there it's not just a way to trick the system they actually go to 13 that's how Peachtree center vectors them into the arrival into metroplex yes so a quick answer the short answer file for the first half of the flight whatever the direction is for the first half of the flight i would say do that and you even if four flight complains about it still push that button once you make the turn <clears throat> this yeah. happens to us all the time giving planes to uh vietnam mm-hmm. they round a corner and then they go from odd to mm. even yeah true Th- then it just kind of depends on the controller. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to change them? Do you want to let them change them? You know, maybe you just leave them. It, it's just sort of, you know, hit or miss. We always go. So when we're looking at the the altitude, let's say for a departure off a triad, and we're not sure if they should be at seven or eight, we just look at, we don't look at the route. We'll look at where you're going, where you are, and where you're trying to go. Mm. And is that odd or even? And if it's even, event- if and I issue an even altitude, eventually you're going to get, you know, you're going to be in the right place mm-hmm. once you make the make the corner. Mm-hmm. And it just sort of depends. I'm trying to look at the map and how far is this? How far are you flying? It looks like a pretty good chunk. Yeah, maybe. it'd be like going through... Um mountain before you turn to like somewhere in kentucky maybe right if you had riding like that we I, as a controller i don't remember ever getting heartburn about it i would give you whatever you requested and it, assuming you're going to turn left at some point i might give you an odd or an even altitude and not have any problem handing you off to to mountain i wouldn't care right and they don't either right? they don't not you can really give them eight nine or ten up there they don't care right yeah, we send them a 10 wrong for direction every single morning. But they're landing at that airport. Now, if you looked at it and you're like, well, hey, he's going to turn left. That's why he wants and he's to do it. fly through your airspace. Yeah. Right. And that does get around an Atlanta sector. So it's an airspace issue for Triad. They're trying to get you. Eventually, you're probably going to end up touching that center airspace anyway, no matter how hard you try to avoid it. So but do you think filing for the first half is I think a that's bad fine. idea? No, okay. I think that's totally fine. Because then that controller, you know, that's sending you on that way. The next one, you know, the next few, I mean, this is like a hundred and some, Mm -hmm. you know, miles of, of of an odd altitude. They're going to be happy. Yeah. Once you turn the corner, whoever has you, when you turn the corner, is going to go, Hey, do you want nine or, or do you want 10 or what do you want? You know? Yeah. And that's when you say, Oh, I'll take 10. I like it. I don't think there's a great way to accomplish this because you're going to run into a controller that says, what are you doing? Yeah, why you Your destination there? is uh, on an even, you know. <laughs> it's uh, always going to be that person. All right. We have feedback back up to mid-July of 2024. We're right on the show. We tried to give you a heads up. If you were going to be on the show, we respond via email. For those that don't make the show, check your spam folder if you missed a response from us. AG, anything to add before we hit the chat? I do not. Closing out episode 349 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Visit OpposingBases.com where you can send a written or audio question to be included on a show. Find AG and RH on Instagram at Opposing Bases. Send your questions to feedback at OpposingBases.com. For access to live stream video recordings, bonus audio, early recordings, and discounts on show merchandise, visit patreon.com slash opposing bases to join an awesome aviation community. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the FAA, Penguin Airlines, or the United States Army episodes shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, consult an aviation attorney or a certified flight instructor. Drop.
drop.